Yeah, so I'm Stefano Armon. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science. Uh, here at Stanford, I'm affiliated with the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Lab. As you might have heard, uh, it's a really exciting time to be doing AI research. Thanks to recent advancing, advances in uh, sensing technology, we are able to gather massive data sets in a lot of different domains. We have new techniques to store this data, to communicate it efficiently across networks, to process the data at scales that were not even imaginable a few decades ago. And what this means is that we've, we are able to collect these massive data sets and we can extract information from them. And these techniques have really revolutionized many subfields of computer science, and in particular, they led to some major improvements in uh, my subfield, which is artificial intelligence. It really revolutionized the way in which we think about problems, the way in which we solve the problems, and uh, it really bootstrapped this, uh, this approach based on machine learning, based on probabilistic modeling, based on probabilistic inference. So in the past uh, few years, we have seen an enormous success in a lot of applications. Uh, we are building machines that can imi imitate human behavior at increasingly more complex tasks. We have computers or even phones these days that can understand when we speak to them. They can answer simple questions. They can recognize objects, faces, and images and tag them, say, on Facebook. We have uh, automatic machine translation tools like uh, Google Translate that can translate between different languages. Soon we'll have systems that can translate automatically spoken dialogues between two different, uh, two different languages. Uh, you know, you've seen probably all seen Google cars uh, driving around and collecting data. Soon we're going to have uh, autonomous driving systems that are going to be deployed and are going to be on the streets. So there is really a lot of excitement about artificial intelligence. Uh, a lot of companies are investing heavily on AI, They're trying to recruit all the best people. Uh, what this means uh, is also that there is a lot of emphasis, there is a lot of focus on applications that, are, that have market value, that uh, can be monetized in some way. Uh, this is great because, of course, they are meeting demands that are really out there. But I think if we take a step back and if we look at the big picture, we'll see that there are other kind of needs, other kind of goals that we should think about, we should be trying to solve uh, as a society. And these include things like uh, ending poverty and hunger in the, in the world uh, or finding uh, sources of affordable and clean energy, which is probably very dear to this audience, or preserving the planet for future generation or fixing climate change. And these are very important challenges. They've been recognized by the United Nations. They've been adopted by uh, over 150 countries. And, and my research is really here. It's at the intersection between those two worlds. It's trying to build a bridge between these two, these two worlds. It's a new field that we're calling computational sustainability, where we're trying to find ways to apply all these cool ideas, these cool techniques from computer science and find ways to use them to help solve some of these big, important sustainability challenges. And uh, sort of my research in this area is centered around three main themes. One is the use of very large data sets, what we call big data. Uh, we always use uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques to try to understand these data sets, try to infer new knowledge from the data, try to build models that we can use to predict, and uh, also optimization. We want to use these models to make better decisions. We want to optimize systems. We want to figure out what's the best way to allocate limited resources. And I've worked on a number of projects in this space, ranging from finding policies to optimally manage natural resources over time. Recently, since moving to Stanford, we've been looking at uh, modeling groundwater systems and weather systems. Of course, we, we all know about the drought uh, that is affecting California. These systems are not well understood. We have a lot of data from remote sensing. And uh, we think that using machine learning and this uh, kind of data-driven modeling approaches can provide some interesting insights into these, uh, into these systems. I worked uh, in the energy space, uh, working on how to use AI techniques to improve the efficiency of energy systems, and also helping out material scientists to speed up the discovery process of new materials. They are generating these very large data sets through high throughput experiments, and we developed some techniques to automatically analyze this data and, and uh, speed up the, the discovery process. And uh, recently, I've also been working in the context of development. How can we use machine learning and, uh, and sequential decision-making ideas to understand uh, poverty in the developing world? Can we use large data sets from 
uh, satellites, for example, to uh, automatically understand the images and try to build models of uh, livelihoods and try to figure out the best ways to use the limited resources that we have to, to fight these, uh, these issues. Now, given that this is an energy seminar, I'm not going to be talking about this other project. And instead, I'll be focusing on the materials discovery work using machine learning in the context of material science and on the optimization of energy systems. So let's get started. Uh, why materials? Well, materials technology has been historically at the foundation of successful thriving civilizations. Uh, if you think about it, there are entire historical periods that are named after a material, Stone Age, Copper Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age. Uh, historically, new developments in materials have always led to these major shifts, major changes in the economic aspects of the societies, into the society, other societal aspects, the culture. So if we want to achieve clean and sustainable energy, I think it's pretty clear that we're gonna, we're gonna need to find ways to speed up, to scale up the discovery process of new advanced materials. For example, uh, we know that uh, hydrogen fuel cells or solar, solar fuel cells are very promising enabling technologies for a uh, lot in lots of applications like electric vehicles or the storage of renewable energies, but their performance is essentially dependent and critically dependent on the kind of materials that we use. So uh, if we want to push the boundaries even further, we want to make them more cost effective, we want to make them more widely used in practice, we're going to have to find new materials. This was also recognized by the government. Uh, a few years ago, the president launched the Materials Genome Initiative. It's a multi-agency initiative that is aimed at accelerating the pace and reduce the cost of discovery deployment of advanced material systems. Now, what, what does this have to do with computer science? It turns out that this, um, this area of research is really opening up new interesting research opportunities for computer science research, as was highlighted here in the, in the original slide from the Materials Genome Initiative from the government. Clearly, material scientists have been using computational tools for a long time, simulations, quantum simulations, and things like that, and they are very good at it, some of the biggest um, supercomputer centers that we have in the, in the country are funded by DOE and are used precisely for this type of research. But I think there is a, a shift going on. There is a, little, there is a paradigm change. Uh, we're starting to see scientists that are collecting very large data sets through, say, high throughput experiment, experiments. And uh, what this means is that it's really creating opportunities for using different types of tools, different type of ideas from computer science, not just simulations, but things like machine learning, things like optimization. Uh, can we figure out, can we discover new knowledge based on data? Can we figure out ways to optimize the data collection process or even figuring out, use machine learning to guide the way in which we design experiments? So in some ways, this reminds me of the early days of computational biology. Uh, scientists were collecting these very large data sets and from genomics and you know, they had no way to process them by hand. So they had to come up with new computational models, new computational techniques to actually make sense of the data, to actually do something useful with it. So my interest in, in, this, in this area started back uh, doing PhD at Cornell. There I was interacting with uh, Bruce Van Dover, who is a material scientist leading the Energy Materials Center at Cornell, and John Gregoire, who was also a student back then and recently joined uh, the JCAP, the Joint Center for Artificial Photosy Photosynthesis at Caltech. And uh, what really got excited me about their, their vision was that they were trying to speed up, to scale up, to accelerate the discovery process of new materials uh, by automating the process as much as possible. Uh, Essentially, this is a high-level picture. I apologize to the material scientists in the room if, if it's not exactly accurate. But the idea is that uh, they set up a uh, first component of their pipeline is a high-throughput materials synthesis uh, component that is able to generate a lot quickly, a lot of candidate new materials. Like John has a system that can generate a few thousand new materials per day. The way I look at it is some kind of inkjet printer that can generate a lot of candidate uh, new materials uh, in, in a single sort of batch experiment. Then they have a high throughput uh, screening process that can be used to collect data about the materials that they generate. 
And uh, this pipeline produces a lot of data. That's the challenge. The challenge is that we generate these massive data sets and at this point, the bottleneck is really the human time to process the data, interpret the data, and try to make sense of it. And so what got me interested is this part, which is how do we actually process automatically? How do we scale this up by introducing some clever computational techniques? And there are sort of, there is a whole stack of things that you can do with the data. It starts from simple things like data cleaning, uh, things like quality assurance, trying to do anomaly detection, figure out if things are going wrong in the experiment, all the way to trying to identify the crystal structure of the materials, which is something I'm gonna talk about. And hopefully, this is something we haven't done, but it's sort of like our, our vision, our dream, is to actually close the loop, figuring out ways in which we can extract new knowledge from the data, we can use it to guide the design of new experiments, figure out what's a promising candidate material that we can try, and, or even simple, in a sim in simpler terms, we can even maybe just try to guide the data collection process, figuring out whether we should abort an experiment because it's not promising, or we should focus on a particular area because that's where the interesting things are going on. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a very exciting, I think, area for computer science research, and what I'm gonna talk about next is one piece uh, that's one step in, in, in this direction. So here is how their, uh, their, their approach works, again, on a very high level. They start with a silicon wafer in a vacuum chamber, and then uh, they sputter three metals at the corners. And what they get is they get a continuous composition spread where at different points on the silicon wafer correspond to different concentrations of the three basic metals. So say up, up to this corner, you get 100% of metal A, down here 100% of metal B, here in the middle you probably get 50-50, and so forth. So you get a deliberately inhomogeneous composition spread on the, on the wafer. And uh, the idea is that with a single batch experiment, you generate a lot of candidate materials. Hopefully they are gonna have different physical and chemical properties, and hopefully you're gonna find something useful by doing like this single experiment. Uh, so after you do this, you get what they call a combinatorial library. Uh, it's made by two things. One is a set of samples, just points that you actually, uh, for which you collect data. And the other one is a distribution of crystalline phases within each sample. Here I'm showing them with this, I don't know if you can see the colors very well, but these areas are pure phases. They correspond to areas in which the, um, the crystal structure doesn't change. So, and the challenge here is that phases can be mixed. There is an actual, there is a distribution of phases over, over points. And so uh, the phase map identifies is this, is this map telling us at every point what phases are present there and what's the, the relative composition of the two phases. And uh, yeah, the challenge is that we don't only get to see pure phases, but we get to see regions where there is a composition of more than one. So how do we, the goal is gonna be to try to identify this phase map. How do we get some information about the, the phases? What they, the, the kind of data we were playing with was, was from X-ray diffraction. The idea is that you uh, collect a diffraction pattern by hitting the point with a high energy X-ray, uh, say generated by a synchrotron, and uh, you get a diffraction pattern, something that looks like this, that uh, characterizes the underlying crystal structure. And if you integrate it, uh, sort of radially, you get a signal for every point that looks like this, and the position of these peaks are characteristic of the particular crystal structure that we have at that point. Uh, now, the challenge is the following. The challenge is that when we have points that are uh, where we get to see a mixture of more than one pure phase, the spectrum that we get, the measurement that we get for these kind of points is gonna be a composition, is gonna be a mixture of the, uh, the patterns that correspond to, to, to the two uh, pure phases. So it's gonna look something like this, where we have a composition of this piece and that other piece. And the challenge is to disentangle these two factors and figuring out what are the individual components. 
This is what we call in signal processing, it's the uh, cocktail party problem, where you are in a room full of people chatting between each other, you're hearing a signal, which is the mixture of all the voices in the room, and you need to somehow figure out, and, and you need to be able to focus and try to understand what a single person is saying. So this is the phase map identification problem. We have our input, which are the diffraction patterns for each individual point. The output, what we want to get, is this phase map, uh, the pure regions, the mixed regions, and we want to identify the X-ray diffraction pattern that characterizes each individual pure phase. And the challenge is that uh, there, there are also a number of constraints that we want this phase map to satisfy. Uh, we, we know that these phases, these regions, are going to be contiguous in that space. Uh, we know that there cannot be mixture of more than a certain number of phases in each point. Even uh, points within an individual phase don't necessarily have all the same spectrum. The spectrum can shift by a little bit, uh, but in a somewhat predictable way. And of course, there is a lot of noise, there is air scattering, there are all sorts of things that are going on, so we need to be able to build a system that is robust to that. Is the setup clear up to here? What's the problem? Any questions? Good. So what's the basic idea? The basic idea is we're going to do unsupervised classification. So the picture looks like this. We have a bunch of objects, and they have different characteristics, say color and shape. Here we have oranges and apples. Oranges and apples are, are objects, they have different shapes. And if you look at each individual point and you look at the, at, um, the characteristics of that point in this feature space based on color and shape, we're going to get a bunch of points. And the goal is to be able to somehow cluster them based on these two char characteristics. So we need to be able to figure out that there are two types of objects, one that looks like oranges, the other one that looks like apples. That's going to be the basic idea. Mathematically, what we can do is we can formulate this as a matrix factorization problem. We build a matrix where we put in every column one of the diffraction patterns, and I, essentially what we want to do is we want to find a lower rank approximation of this matrix. We want to find k basis vectors that we're going to put in this yellow matrix, such that each individual diffraction pattern that we measure can be written as a linear combination of these basis vectors. That's the basic idea. Here we're assuming that we know k. We know the number of, of faces. The challenge is that uh, the data is not negative. It doesn't make sense to get uh, negative numbers here. There are sort of electron counts. So we also need to enforce that these matrices, w and h, are non-negative entry-wise. So that's why it's called non-negative matrix factorization. So you can formulate this as an optimization problem. You have your data, which is in this matrix A. You look for new matrices W and H, such that they give, uh, it's a good low rank approximation of A. Think of that norm up here as like Frobenius norm. And uh, we have to enforce these constraints that the matrices are both non-negative. So if you run it on, on, on some data, it turns out that it scales pretty well, although it's known to be intractable in the worst case. In practice, there are some reasonable heuristics to solve this problem. The problem is that it does not enforce all those constraints that we know the true phases must satisfy. So for example, here is a system with aluminum, lithium, and iron. It has six phases shown up here in the first row. The results that you get if you run non-negative matrix factorization, NMF for short, uh, don't match very well the ground truth. These images on the bottom row should be similar to the one on the first row. What happens is that it produces phases that are disconnected. It produces mixture, mixtures of more than, than three phases in this case. So it doesn't give a good, uh, a good solution. It doesn't provide the answer that we were looking for. Yeah? You said, you said done with like, uh, known good data. That data was synthetic. It's synthesized with no error. Yeah. So it's not an error problem. It's really just a just the, the optimization problem we're trying to solve is not the one we want. It's not a good model, basically. So why, why, do you, why what cause those uh, Essentially, it can find a better fit, but it, that violates these physical constraints. So it's finding a solution that is non-physical, but it minimizes that objective function because we have the wrong objective function. Yeah. Did you say how you chose your features? How, what? How do you choose your features? Um, full spectra here. You don't think. Yeah. 
So our approach was to incorporate some prior knowledge into the model. Here we used what we call a satisfiability modulo theory, which is a way to combine logic with uh, arithmetic. So you have a very expressive modeling language where you can reason about uh, automatically about uh, real valid quantities, like the kind of measurement data that we have, but it's very expressive in the sense that you can encode complex relationship between the variables, like trying to, to some extent, at least to a f first cut, trying to encode this, what we know about the physics of the system, those constraints that we were talking about before. So if we do that, we get a new optimization problem where we have some variables that represent the known basis patterns, and the idea is that we want to make sure that they explain the measurement data as well as possible, and they have to satisfy all these constraints. Now we're gonna, it's a complicated formulation, I'm not gonna go through the details, but to some extent, you can view this in, in the following way. We have the same objective function as before, try to find a good low rank approximation, but it's gonna be, it's gonna have some extra variables, and it's gonna be subject to more complex constraints on the variables. It's not just gonna be non-negativity, it's gonna be a bunch of other constraints that encode the prior knowledge that we have about, about the system. So for example, we might want to say that each, each, uh, basic, each, each measurement point, each sample, is a linear combination of at most uh, S basis vectors, where S might be smaller than K. And to do that, you, know, you can introduce some extra variables that are binary, and you can encode the fact that they must sum, uh, they, can be, they must be smaller than S, and this is encoding, in terms of constraints, the prior knowledge that we have. So at the end of the day, we end up with uh, another optimization problem, which is non-convex, mixed integer, non-linear. So it's a pretty nasty problem to optimize. Uh, the good news is that there is some structure. If we fix W, then the objective is quadratic in H, and the constraints are linear in H. So it becomes still not an easy problem, but it's a mixed integer quadratic program. And we have pretty good solvers to do that. You can relax the binary variables. You're going to get a quadratic program. You can use that to do some kind of branch and bound search. And these tractable relaxations can be used to prune the search space. And you can actually, in practice, you can solve pretty large problems reasonably efficiently. So the strategy is fairly simple. We can just do coordinate descent, block coordinate descent on the variables. So we start initializing the, the, the variables somehow, say random. And then uh, we keep alternating between optimizing the H and the W. <coughs> and uh, at every step, the objective function is guaranteed to improve, and it also satisfies the constraints, the, whatever we know, the prior knowledge that we have about the system. And uh, this turns out to work better in practice. It's still not perfect, but better. This is the same system as before. Uh, the dots corresponds to the, the points that we classify as belonging to a particular phase. The shaded area correspond to the ground truth phases in this system. So it's doing a reasonable job in this case. It's still missing some points at the co as the borders, but those have, have very little sort of concentration of the phase, so it's, it's understandable that it's getting the, the, wrong, uh, the wrong answer there. So by incorporating some prior knowledge about the physics of the system, we can get uh, significantly improved accuracy, and we get better phase maps. Uh, we tried it on some real world data. Uh, here, it's harder to evaluate the results because we don't have ground truth. Uh, what we can do is we have some sort of uh, way to verify that the results make sense. In this case, the system, we have like a nice uh, uh, user interface that you can, where you can plug in the data that you get from the synchrotron and shows you the phases and does all the, the, the plots for you. Uh, in this case, uh, it uh, recovers a phase, this, what it calls phase one, that matches fairly well one of the ones that we found in the literature, which is sort of saying that, yeah, it's probably doing the right thing. Uh, we used it on other data. This is a tantalum, rhodium, palladium. I came up with this uh, phase map and this purple region here seems to correspond to a region with uh, high fluorescence activity. So again, seems to indicate that the phase map that we get kind of makes sense. But again, we don't have ground truth, so these this, this are harder to evaluate. 
So now we recently started some collaboration with people at Slack, EGN and Apurva. They also have, they are sitting on a lot of data, uh, slightly different type of data, but they have a pipeline to, that can generate a, a, a lot of, a lot of absorption, absor <coughs> absorption data. Uh, so we're trying to see whether we can apply the same. We have a master student that is trying to apply this, uh, this idea, these techniques to the data that, that they have been collecting up at Slack. So any questions on this part before I move on to the next uh, topic? Good. So this is again another collaboration with people at Slack. I think Daniel is there, so <laughs> he might tell you more about the actual domain, uh, what's really going on there. But uh, the idea is that uh, uh, we have the LCLS, which is this Linux coherent light source, which is the world's first X-ray laser, 10 billion times brighter than any other X-ray source before it. Very complex machine, uh, difficult to operate, it requires tuning. It's currently done by operators, sort of in a pretty much ad hoc way. And uh, given that the operating costs are about $1,000 per minute, uh, Daniel approached me at some point and said, well, it would be nice if we find a way to make the parameter tuning better, whether we can, optim whether we can do it automatically, we can make it faster, we can make it work better. And the good news is that they have a lot of data. They have an archiving system that is recording 200,000 independent variables once per second, and it goes back several years. So we have lots of data available, a lot of data points. And uh, the question is, can we use machine learning methods to come up with better ways to automatically tune the, the machine? Uh, so here we've been taking a Bayesian non-parametric approach. So these are very preliminary results, uh, but they seem to be very promising. It's a pretty, pretty exciting project. So the idea is that we want to come up with a function that is able to map the parameters that we can tune and all other independent variables to the output we care about, which is how well, what's the energy output, how well is the machine performing. So we don't know what's the relationship between these variables and the output. So what we're gonna say is we're gonna start with a week prior that is just saying, well, whatever that function is, is gonna be some smooth function. If you change the parameters a little bit, the output is not gonna change by much. And then uh, what we do is when we get training data, we have data from, from the past, we know how well the machine performed when the parameters were set in certain ways. So we can use this information, we can use this evidence to update our prior and get a posterior distribution over these predictive functions. So it will tell us, and by doing this, we are able to predict how well the machine will work when we set the parameters in some new way that we haven't tried before. And uh, the nice thing is that we don't only get a single value, but we also get some measure of uncertainty. So we have an idea of how much we believe the prediction that we make about how the machine will perform uh, if we set the parameters in some way that we haven't tried before. So the basic formulation is nice, but it doesn't scale to large data sets. It scales roughly as n cube. So the number of computations that you have to do is roughly n cube, where n is the number of training points. So we had to introduce some approximations to make it scale. Essentially, it all boils down to using low rank approximations of some covariance matrices to, to make it scale. And you, know, you introduce some approximations, but we can scale it up to larger training sets. And it seems to be working uh, reasonably well. It seems to be able to, here it's, I'm showing the <coughs> predicted energy versus the true energy, seems to be uh, doing a reasonable job at uh, <coughs> predicting on, on new data how well the machine will perform as we set the parameters in different ways. <coughs> And uh, yeah, so this is still preliminary, but it's pretty exciting. And uh, the next step that we are looking into is to do some uh, kind of Bayesian optimization. Here the idea is that we want to be able to optimize this, this function that's mapping parameters to how well the machine performs in an online fashion. So we want to figure out a way to search this huge parameter space efficiently. And this is particularly suitable for settings where evaluating the function is very expensive. Like you actually have to do an experiment to figure out how well the, the machine performs at a given, uh, for a given parameter value. 
So we can use a very similar approach. We have uh, posterior over the predictive function that is telling us how well we think the machine will work if we set the parameters in a certain way. And then what we can do is we can try to compute, we can do some optimization on top of that to figure out what would be the next parameter that we should try in order to, and, and, and there are several objectives that we might be interested in. One is to say, how should we set the next uh, parameters so that we maximize the probability of improving? Or we could try to maximize the expected improvement. We could try to find the point, the parameter settings that will maximize the expected improvement. So we have this, what we call an acquisition function that will look like this. For example, in this case, it will tell us that the, the best point that we should try is somewhere around here. Because, so in some sense, you want to be close to the points you already know that work well, but at the same time, you want to be able to take into account uncertainty. You want to be able to uh, make sure that you're going to be exploring areas of the parameter space where you don't know how the machine will perform. So it's a, this is a classic uh, problem that we have in this kind of sequential uh, decision-making problems. It's called the exploration versus exploitation trade-off. On the one hand, you want to be exploiting, so you want to try out points where you are near or very close to where you know that the system is going to work well. But on the other hand, you want to make sure that you explore, that you're going to try out parameter settings where you don't know, you have no idea how well the machine will perform. And this approach, this Bayesian optimization approach, provides uh, a sound and a principled framework to deal with this classic trade-off in, in, in a principled way. And so we're working it towards implementing this and, and trying it out in, uh, directly on the, on the, the machine. So, Questions on this part? Cool. So the, the final project I wanted to talk about is uh, one project I did during my, my PhD on uh, trying to optimize the efficiency of uh, multi-battery systems. As we all know, uh, electric and hybrid vehicles are a very promising approach towards uh, more sustainable transportation systems. One of their main limitations is given by their batteries. They have high cost, limited capacity. They might be inefficient. Maybe there are better ways to, to, to improve their efficiency. So what we were looking at was a way to see whether we can use AI techniques, similar kind of optimization ideas, to improve the efficiency of these systems. And in particular, we were looking at multiple battery systems, where this was an idea that came out from CMU, the, the charge car project. Uh, where they were considering these setups where you have multiple batteries with different capacities. Some are big uh, but inefficient and some are small, like a supercapacitor, but very efficient. And the hope is to get the best of both worlds. You want to have large capacity, you want to have high efficiency, and you want to have lower, uh, low cost of ownership. So the way I think of this is sort of like a hierarchy of, uh, of the classic hierarchy of memories that we have in a computer system where you have disks with high capacity, low latency, high latency, and then you have a uh, cache that is very small, but very, very, very fast. And by being clever about the ways you use this hierarchy of memories, you can sometimes approach, you can sometimes get really the best of both worlds. So the question there was to, to what extent can we actually uh, exploit the fact that we have multiple batteries, can we actually manage them in a more efficient way? So that was sort of the problem. The problem was take past driving behavior, look at current vehicle conditions like position, speed, time of the day, everything you can think of, and try to figure out what we were trying to compute was how to allocate the demand uh, between the different batteries and how to, how to store the energy that we get from, from, uh, from braking. And uh, it turns out that this requires a good model of driving behavior. You want to be able to predict sort of ahead of time high current events corresponding to accelerations or sudden decelerations. So what we did is we tried to learn a model of driving behavior using a large data set of commuter trips that were crowdsourced in the US, so were volunteered by uh, people across the country. And uh, so we used that data, we used, um, uh, we used open street maps to have an idea about traffic lights and signs and speed limits. 
and uh, some an elevation map from USGS to try to figure out whether people are going to downhill or uphill. And uh, we combine that with some optimization approaches and uh, again some machine learning to try to generalize to new settings that we hadn't seen before. And uh, what we got at the end was a, mm, a new system, an intelligent, what we call an intelligent management system that uh, was able to significantly improve, it led to some significant energy savings for the simulator, for the setup that uh, uh, was being considered by, by the, the people at the charge car project. So, yeah, this is the, the end of the talk. Uh, I guess you might have heard about these growing concerns that people are raising about the future, about the threats that AI is posing to the future of humanity. Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking are wondering whether robots will take our place and then we'll all be out of jobs. I think we can take a more positive attitude here. We can think about all these recent advances and all these uh, new techniques and all these uh, new methods that we're developing. We can think about ways to use them to have a uh, beneficial influence on society in the context of energy, sustainability, conservation, and, and, and many more. So it's an exciting area to work on because it's really also opening up new interesting opportunities for doing CS research. It's really like a two-way street between computational sciences and sustainability sciences. Sometimes we come up with new algorithms, we figure out ways to apply them to sustainability problems. Other times we are encountering new problems that people have not looked at before. We have to come up with new uh, computational models or methods to, to deal with these new challenges. So yeah, thanks for having me here. If you guys have any problem that sort of seems related to this, where you can think, where you think you might need help uh, and you think you might be able to apply some of these techniques and some of these ideas, uh, please talk to me. I'm happy to, to talk to people and see whether there are opportunities for collaboration and finding ways to apply techniques like this to, to, to your problem. Thank you. Question? I have a question. Uh, in all of the applications you showed, but particularly the last one, how do you deal with the sample bias? So, I mean, given that you've had source across the country, presumably you have more trips to the US than you So, like, how do you deal with that in your market? Well, the, you know, like, we, oh, these are always, we always try to validate, these are, the results are always validated in cross validation. So, to some extent, we try to account for that. Of course, you know, we always use regularization. We try, it's, we're trying to build systems that will, to some extent, generalize to new data as much as possible. Then it's always hard to say whether the system will actually work on new data that you haven't ever seen before, and it cannot do it in general, because you know, if, you, if the system has not been trained on that particular situation, it's not going to work. Uh, so I think what's interesting about, for example, introducing prior knowledge that you have, say, the physics of the system, then we know those are sort of uh, constant, they won't change. So that's a good way to make sure that the system will work well, will work in the way you want, also in the new scenarios. But yeah, generally speaking, we are definitely, these are data-driven models, and so, you know, it is like garbage in, garbage out, that we cannot get around that. So, if, but if you were to, you know, do that analysis and then try to apply it to actually, you know, a battery management system that Tesla or somebody might put in a car, like, what would be your recommendation? <laughs> How to, you know, if you wanted to actually use that, you're not going to have all the data. Well, the, the, the typical way these things are done is you can just collect more data and then just, you know, this, the way we think about these problems is not, we don't care about producing a output, what we care about is producing algorithms such that no matter what you put in as output, it's going to produce hopefully a good solution. So. What we are recommending is our algorithms and models that then companies or people that are interested in this can then apply on their data and uh, I'm sure improve our, our results. I mean, we're always, in academia, we're always limited in the kind of data sets that we have access to. So there is no point in trying to compete with companies on that because we just cannot scale to that, to that size. We don't, don't have the resources to do that. But what we can do is we can provide algorithms, we can provide ideas, and then companies can I sort of apply them to their to their particular case. Yeah. 
the last example, what's the parameter you're optimizing for? Is it the size of the different batteries in the car? Is it the management? So we were trying to optimize for the efficiency, which basically a high, we were, the one way to think about it is we were trying to keep the output as stable as possible. So we're basically accounting for Quicker's law, and uh, that was sort of the main thing we we're optimizing. For. So, so that's your objective. Well, well, so what what can you change? You can change the, what you can change is allocate the how much energy you take out from the different hierarchy of batteries, how much energy you move, and where you put it back when you get when you get when it breaks, the car breaks. Uh, that was basically what you can play with. So the demand is fixed. You cannot change that. What you can do is you can try to keep it sort of as stable as possible so that uh, the inefficiencies are hopefully smaller. But it was based on the simulator. The simulator was telling us what's the efficiency that you're getting at the end. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question about the earlier example you showed, the material science example, with the, I think it was a rhodium ternary alloy where you show different uh, fluorescence intensity. Mm -hmm. My understanding is you, you, you did this simultaneous deposition of three elements, and then a robot or just an XY stage was measuring uh, fluorescence on, 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 a, on, on a coordinate system. Also X-ray diffraction and fluorescence. Also did X-ray yeah. diffraction. Where exactly does now um, the machine learning aspect coming to play in this particular example. In that example was to identify the crystal structure automatically, just purely based on X-ray diffraction. And then uh, the idea was to always sort of try to relate the phases to the properties that we care about, like fluorescence. Uh, so, but we were just looking at the X-ray and trying to see whether we can come up with the phases, the phase map. That's something we're actually, we're actually thinking about with John, is how can we incorporate different sources of signal, like optics or other type of high throughput screening uh, sort of pipelines that he has in place. Can we combine multiple sources of data and come up with better phase maps? Yeah, Mattel. Uh, so related to this question then, maybe a silly question, but you I think you stated that they are able to produce 100,000 combination per day. Yeah. Uh, how does the rate of your uh, machine learning process compare to this rate of production? It's, Is it faster? It's pretty fast. Uh, we, you know, it maybe takes a minute or so to get a result. So it's, you know, it's getting there. It's way better. Like if you do it by hand, it takes them a week to process a sample. So it went from one week to a few minutes. It's still probably not good enough. We need to scale it up more, but at least it's better. Like the people I'm talking in Slack, they are sitting on piles of hard drives with data and they just can't keep up on analyzing it. So they would really, it would really help them if we had ways to process the data automatically, at least at the first cut, analyze it a little bit. There's still room to improve yeah. this procedure, such that it's almost live. You take the data and live you get the result. Ideally, yeah, because ideally what you would want to do is you would want to, as you get the data live, you could try to come up with a phase map, try to figure out where the boundaries are, then you can sort of change the sampling so that you sample more often at the boundary and you try to figure out what's really going on. We never got to do that, but ideally that's what we want. So what's the... Okay. No, just if I can ask one further question. So what would be the rate at which you need to really analyze this data or what's the improvement that you need to add on your algorithms to get there? Well I guess we would is it something you can actually achieve or is it I think we can achieve it by making some simplifications, just maybe, you know, like right now we're looking at the entire spectra, we're not but potentially you can do some kind of PCA, you can do some kind of random projection and, or, or reduce the dimensionality of the data to scale it up. Then it's sort of like a trade-off and seeing how much accuracy you lose versus how much computational advantage you get. So I think there is space to explore. The thing is we never got to actually have access to the experimental pipeline and get it to actually plug in our stuff. They would never let us do that. So we never even tried to scale it up. But at some point it would be nice if we could, could really do it. Thank you for your last comment. I 
the impact of the natural history on the aging materials that doesn't make sense. But I'm not familiar with that. I'm, I'm a computer scientist. I always rely on my collaborators on the sort of domain expertise, but I'd be happy to talk about that. There are some classic measures when you have, like, it, it's a good question. Like, there is not a unique. Uh, clearly defined measure of when you try to evaluate clustering algorithms. There are a number of ways to do that based on entropy, based on accuracy, precision, recall, and there's not a single best one that is, you know, that all uh, our peers have agreed on. We evaluated on a number of them, and it seems to perform definitely better than MF on most of them. Uh, and sort of you've seen visually, it seems to give the right answer. But you know, like in the in the papers, we've done some experiments, like pretty extensive experimental results on synthetic data, so you can see all the numbers there, and uh, it, it compares favorably to other techniques. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's give Professor 